you want to make 50 million dollars selling violent video games to kids, go for it. We'll put you on the cover of Wired magazine. But you want to make half a million dollars trying to cure kids of malaria, and you're considered a parasite yourself. In a provocative TED talk about charity, activist and professional fundraiser Dan Pallada pointed out a double standard. Businesses are celebrated for risk-taking and making money, while nonprofits are expected to keep overhead low as they beg for the funds they need to make life better for others. Pallada says we have it all wrong. Nonprofits should not be rewarded for how little they spend, but for how much they accomplish. He suggests we start rewarding charities for what they do even if that means paying competitive salaries and carrying a lot of expenses. A conversation with Dan Pallada on Midday, after the news. And welcome to Midday, everyone. I'm Dan Rodericks, with you every Monday through Friday from noon to 2 on WYPR Baltimore, WYPF Frederick and Hagerstown, WYPO Ocean City and streaming live online through WYPR.org. We thank you again for making Midday part of your day. Maryland has thousands of nonprofit organizations of all different sizes, serving all kinds of causes from raising money for medical research to providing recreation to supporting the arts to helping low-income families with food, housing, and energy bills. Nonprofits rely primarily on charity for the funds they need to operate, and they are expected to be frugal, carrying low overhead and keeping their staff salaries at levels that will not raise eyebrows. In a TED Talk recorded last year and heard on the TED Radio Hour here on WYPR, longtime social activist and fundraiser Dan Pallada outlined what he saw as problems in how we perceive the nonprofit sector. While Americans often understand the risk-taking and investment made in the for-profit business world, we're uncomfortable with these ideas when applied to social causes. Consider, he says, the double standard in compensation. So in the for-profit sector, the more value you produce, the more money you can make. But we don't like nonprofits to use money to incentivize people to produce more in social service. We have a visceral reaction to the idea that anyone would make very much money helping other people. Interesting that we don't have a visceral reaction to the notion that people would make a lot of money not helping other people. You know, you want to make $50 million selling violent video games to kids, go for it. We'll put you on the cover of Wired magazine, but you want to make half a million dollars trying to cure kids of malaria, and you're considered a <laughs> parasite yourself. And we think of this as our system of ethics, but what we don't realize is that this system has a powerful side effect, which is it gives a really stark, mutually exclusive choice between doing very well for yourself and your family or doing good for the world to the brightest minds coming out of our best universities and sends tens of thousands of people who could make a huge difference in the nonprofit sector, marching every year directly into the for-profit sector because they're not willing to make that kind of lifelong economic sacrifice. Business Week did a survey, looked at the compensation packages for MBAs 10 years out of business school. And the median compensation for a Stanford MBA with bonus at the age of 38 was $400,000. Meanwhile, for the same year, the average salary for the CEO of a $5 million-plus medical charity in the U.S. was $232,000, and for a hunger charity, $84,000. Now, there's no way you're going to get a lot of people with $400,000 talent to make a $316,000 sacrifice every year to become the CEO of a hunger charity. Some people say, well, that's just because those MBA types are greedy. Not necessarily. They might be smart. It's cheaper for that person to donate $100,000 every year to the hunger charity, save $50,000 on their taxes, so still be roughly $270,000 a year ahead of the game, now be called a philanthropist because they donated $100,000 to charity, probably sit on the board of the hunger charity, indeed probably supervise the poor SOB who decided to become the CEO of the hunger charity, and have a lifetime of this kind of power and influence and popular praise still ahead of them. 
Dan Pallotta has firsthand experience in the nonprofit world. In fact, years ago, he established unique and successful ways for charities to raise millions of dollars they never imagined with conventional methods of begging. Dan Pallotta's multi-day AIDS rides and breast cancer three-day walks were marketed on a large scale, engaged thousands of people, and raised hundreds of millions of dollars. But criticism of his company, its size, its model, led to its demise. An old Puritan ethic about charities had been violated. We've all been taught that charities should spend as little as possible on overhead things like fundraising under the theory that, well, the less money you spend on fundraising, the more money there is available for the cause. Well, that's true if it's a depressing world in which this pie cannot be made any bigger. But if it's a logical world in which investment in fundraising actually raises more funds and makes the pie bigger, then we have it precisely backwards and we should be investing more money, not less in fundraising, because fundraising is the one thing that has the potential to multiply the amount of money available for the cause that we care about so deeply. I was eager to speak with uh, Dan Pallotta after hearing his TED Talk and thought our midday listeners would appreciate our having him on the show today, so we've invited him to join us. Dan Pallotta speaks about this subject frequently. He's written a couple of books on it, the most recent in 2012. It's called Charity Case, How the Nonprofit World Can Stand Up for Itself and Really Change the World. Dan is the founder of Advertising for Humanity, a company focused on helping humanitarian organizations develop branding so they can raise awareness and money for their causes. His clients include the National Parkinson Foundation and the National Breast Cancer Coalition. Dan Pallotta is also founder of the Charities Defense Council, dedicated to changing how we think about charity. Dan Pallotta, I want to welcome you to Midday on WYPR. Thank you for making time for us today. Thanks for having me, Dan. I know you've been at this uh, for a long time, uh, but I wonder, when did you first start thinking about this? You know, it it really uh, cracks through a, a kind of thinking that uh, most people grow up with, you know, uh, if you if you work for a charity, you're supposed to be poor yourself. <laughs> you know uh, th- this model that we've uh, uh, we've been told is the right model is the morally is the moral model. Um, when did you start thinking? Well, that's that might be upside down. I started thinking about it when we were at the height of our success with Pilata Teamwork. So probably. You know, around 1998, 1999, uh, by 2002, we were raising about $170 million a year. And we were being criticized for doing things that are are standard practice in in business, Uh, doing things that you would be penalized for not doing in business, you know, using money to try and attract the best talent, uh, spending a lot of money on advertising to recruit uh, walkers and riders, uh, taking risks on new types of events, uh, you know, beautiful materials and beautiful uh, qual- production levels on the experiences so that people would have an incredible time and they would want to come back. And we were being criticized for all these things. And I, I began kind of cataloging them and, and realizing, geez, it's it's not just compensation that people have a problem with. They don't like when we send out a nice brochure, but they're all over the Pottery Barn brochure when that comes in the mail. (laughs) Um, You know, they don't like us to try this AIDS event in 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 a new city where it might not succeed because AIDS is a more difficult uh, issue. Well, what does that mean for the cause of AIDS in that city? And and you know, you start to look at the whole thing and you go, wow, there's really a holistic dysfunction at work here that we as a culture have never examined because, you know, we've been raised on this religion that charity shouldn't spend much money, and and that's that. And there's precisely no difference of opinion between, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi and Dick Cheney on the subject of charity. You know, we're all in perfect agreement that, yes, charity should spend very little uh, money so that as much money as possible can go to the cause, or so we think. And and how did this become uh, burnished into our, our thinking? Uh, you've I know you've thought about this. You go back a long way in in history to find the source of this. 
Yeah, well, the first uh, draft of my book was this, it was this very angry book entitled America's Effed Up Ideas About Charity. And my agent said, well, I, don't, I don't think we're going to be able to sell that <laughs> title. And, and in that first draft, I had a simple sentence. I grew up in New England, and I was very familiar with this Puritan deprivation mindset. So I had a simple sentence that said, these ideas come from old Puritan constructs. And my agent challenged me. She said, how do you know that? So... I spent the next six months reading these narcolepsy-inducing books on the early Puritan settlers to New England. (laughs) And uh, the long and short of it was the Puritans came here to the New World for religious reasons, absolutely. But they also came here because they wanted to make a lot of money. These, These diminutive, pious, prayerful people were extremely aggressive capitalists. In fact, they were accused of extreme forms of profit making tendencies by even the other colonists. But at the same time, the Puritans were Calvinists. So they were taught that self-interest was a raging sea that was a sure path to eternal damnation. So this created this enormous psychological tension. They wanted to make all this money. Making all this money would get you sent to hell. In an even weirder uh, 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 situation, making money was a sign that you were right with God but making money for yourself would get you sent to hell. And so what were they to do about this? Well, charity became a big part of their answer. It became this economic sanctuary where they could do penance for their profit-making tendencies at five cents on the dollar. So, of course, how could you make money in charity if charity was your penance for making money in the first place? And we've never re-examined that. You know, like so many other things in life, that got on a track and and it and it never came off and we've never looked at that and said wait a second that's really dysfunctional why why would you incentivize people with money to produce you know sugar water for kids in the developing world uh but but not to cure breast cancer or to end hunger in the world in the first place mm-hmm. and then there was an agreement made somewhere along the line a collective agreement or understanding that charitable giving only amounted to a certain percentage right it, i guess it would depend partly on your faith uh, in the early days and even uh, in in this modern world. But generally, I I think you point out in your TED Talk that charitable giving in the United States has been a pretty flat line for quite a long time. Well, yeah, we're the most generous nation on earth when it comes to philanthropy. We give about $300 billion a year away to charity, and about 75% of that comes from individuals. But Um, that hasn't changed very much as a percentage of GDP. It hasn't changed at all. Charitable giving has remained stuck at 2% of GDP ever since we started measuring it in the 1970s. And that's important because it tells you, the fact that it's remained flat for 40 years tells you the nonprofit sector is not taking market share away from the for-profit sector. Well, why would that be? Well, because we don't really allow it to market. You know, we don't want nonprofit organizations to spend very much money on advertising. And I know these things can be counterintuitive, you know, for donors, the general public, your listeners. And the thing I like to ask people is, I know you don't want your favorite charity to spend very much money on fundraising. But when they spend money on fundraising, that means they can raise more money. You don't want them to spend money on fundraising because you want a lot of money to go to the cause. But if they spent more on fundraising, they would raise a lot more money and a lot more money would go to the cause. And also, if you discourage your favorite charity from spending on fundraising, you're essentially telling them, we don't want you to find any other donors. You know, I don't want that. So they're going to need to depend on you even more if they can't go out and find (laughs) more donors. Do you really want to bear all that burden yourself? You know, the same folks show up at the same fundraiser year after year. Exactly. (laughs) Dan, we're going to take a break here. Many people work in the nonprofit sector here in Baltimore and throughout Maryland, listening online, wherever you are. If you have questions or comments for our guest, Dan Pallotta, please give us a ring during this hour of midday. Locally, 410-662-8780. I'd certainly like to hear from you on this subject. Our toll-free long-distance number, good from anywhere in the country, 866-661-9309. And our midday email address for questions or comments, midday at wypr.org. Dan uh, Pallotta, author of Charity Case, How the Nonprofit World Can Stand Up for Itself and Really Change the World. More on this when we get back.
And welcome back to Midday. Dan Rodericks here, our guest, Dan Pilata, this hour. You might have heard his uh, TED Talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your TED Talk on uh, on uh, nonprofits and charities and, and fundraising and the whole business model and uh, or, or lack of a business model, maybe in nonprofits, Dan. Now that TED Talk you gave last year, I heard it again just before Christmas. It aired on on uh, TED Radio, the TED Radio Hour here in WYPR, in a in a special program called Giving It Away. And I I just curious, what's been the reaction to that? Do you feel like mostly you've been preaching to the choir on this, or have you had some pushback on it? What what kind of reaction has there been to your TED Talk? It's been wonderful. You know, I gave the closing talk at the TED conference last year, which meant I had four days to get myself psyched out by listening to all these great talks that went ahead of me. And, you know, they had the woman who discovered the giant squid and eight-year-old banjo prodigy. So I figured a talk (laughs) on the economics of nonprofits was going to go over like a lead balloon. But it's actually been viewed something like 2.7 million times. It's, It's one of the one of the 50 most viewed TED talks of all time. So clearly, it was a subject that people were ready to talk about. And, you know, sometimes I'm preaching to the choir, but, you know, the choir needs to learn the song. You know, the, the choir needs an intellectual arsenal to advocate for itself. But a lot of times, you know, in my speaking around the country, what's what's most um, encouraging to me is there will be lay people in the audience. And, and after... Uh, you know, a, a one-hour thoughtful talk on this subject, they'll come up to me and say, I'm never going to ask that question about overhead again. I didn't realize <laughs> that I wasn't asking about what good the charity was doing. I'm, I'm never going to force a low salary on my favorite charity again because I want them to have the best person in the same way I want my football team to, you know, invest in the best coach so we can win. So it's been really encouraging. And in uh, June of this past year, uh, and I can't lay claim to it being as a result of my TED Talk or anything, but as the result of a lot of people doing a lot of work, three of the rating agencies, uh, Charity Navigator, the Better Business Bureau, and GuideStar, issued a joint press release to the American public in which they said, uh, we write to correct a misconception about this issue of overhead. Charities don't need low overhead. Many charities need to spend more money on overhead. This was like hell freezing over, uh, especially for Charity Navigator to say something like that. So we're making progress. Uh, on that front, actually, I happen to be gay, and uh, that uh, that press release was issued the same week the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act, so I thought I was living in an alternate wow. universe. Wow, a big for, week. For, <laughs> a big yeah, week for like, you. Wow, what hell? I must be, a, I must be dreaming. You say during uh, your TED Talk, our generation does not want its epitaph to read, we kept charity overhead low. We wanted to read that we changed the world. But, I mean, you've given us a bit of the history about how we got into this uh, but I, it's just something I've always uh, been taught, I guess. I don't know if, if I was taught or I came to understand that nonprofits were not supposed to be profitable, not not, not supposed to uh, be burgeoning with money. Uh, that there that there was that was fraught with lots of problems. You know, people would be making money off the poor, or be making money from causes that uh, maybe maybe were a little dubious. Uh, uh, you know that the that the a potential for fraud was great or something like that. And you know, Dan, over the over the years, there have been, if not scandals and controversies about how much executives of, of nonprofits or even faith-based organizations were, were paying themselves. So people react to that uh, pretty harshly uh, compared to maybe how they react to uh, what goes on on Wall Street. Yeah. Well, yeah, look, there have been scandals and controversies in the corporate world, and it hasn't led to us restricting salaries on the uh, on those CEOs, right? Um, I think we've had a conversation in charity all of our lives about cost. And it's pulled the, you know, it's distracted us from what the real conversation ought to be. The real conversation should be, are we solving these problems? Are we actually helping people? Because if we're actually helping people, I don't really care what the cost is. And if we're not really helping people, I don't really care how, how low your overhead is. If you look, you look at the issue of poverty in America, you know, it's been at 12% ever since the 1970s, about 15% now. Um, breast cancer, you know, 43,000 American women died of breast cancer 23 years ago. 40,000 American women uh, are estimated to have died of breast cancer last year. 
Uh, we're not solving these social problems. And the question I've tried to ask is, why has the nonprofit sector not been able to make more progress on these issues? And some people say, oh, that's not fair. You know, these problems are not the responsibility of the nonprofit sector. They're the role of government. Well, you know, I think they're the role of whoever wants to take responsibility for them. Government doesn't have a right of first refusal on trying to solve these social problems. And while you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin are off dreaming of changing the way the world gets its information, and Richard Branson's going to take people into space. Can the nonprofit sector not dream of solving some of these problems at an accelerated pace in our lifetime? And that's the only reason to have this conversation. Because if we want to see social problems solved at the pace of molasses, we have a system that's really good at doing it. Hmm. But if we want to accelerate the rate of progress we make on these issues, then I think we need to think radically differently about these things. So instead of us talking about costs and how much is this guy making at this charity, let's start asking, what progress are they making? Are we ending homelessness in any of our cities? Are we improving the adult literacy rate? Let's, let's start focusing on those things. And by the way, you make a good point, Dan, and I don't advocate imp improving the fundraising power of organizations that aren't making a difference. I'm talking about those organizations that really are having an impact in the world, and if they had more money and if they had more resources, they could make a massively greater difference in the world. That's where we have to eliminate these restrictions. Uh, that's, a, that's a big if for people. You know, when it comes time to give... Uh, they may say, well, yeah, um, uh, you, you want to raise even more money for this. Co how, do you, how do I know that it'll go toward the cause? And that question, again, about overhead keeps coming up, doesn't it? So how do you answer that? Yeah, well, when, when a charity tells you that the overhead is low, even then you don't know that a lot of money is going to the cause because, unfortunately, charities know that the general public wants to see a very small amount going to overhead. So guess what? All kinds of accounting mechanisms have developed to show the general public that a low percentage of overhead is going to the cause. Well, you, the public may think of the cause in a very different way than the charity is defining it in its accounting. So this overhead question has um, just uh, betrayed us utterly and completely. You know, a, a charity can tell you, a soup kitchen can tell you, only 10% spent on overhead, but you'll never find out the soup is rancid because you never asked any questions about that. Mm -hmm. So I think that two things. We need a really robust kind of iTunes for charity in the United States to give the general public up-to-date, really great narrative and uh, numeric information on all these charities, and we have nothing like that right now. But secondly, I would encourage your listeners, yeah, you know, if there's a disaster in Haiti, you want to give the American Red Cross 50 bucks, go ahead and do that. But with your real philanthropy, think about, you know, your, your ongoing philanthropy. Think about what cause do, is important to me and do I want to have an impact on? What are some of the organizations working on that issue? And then take the time to get to know that organization. You're a philanthropist too, even if you're only giving $500 a year. Take the same amount of time in understanding the charity that you're going to invest in as you take in understanding the candidate that you're going to cast your vote for president for or in the, you know, the specs on the refrigerator that you're going to buy. Um, you know, go visit the charity. Ask for a tour of the facility. Sit down with the development director. Ask them to tell you what are your goals and what progress are you making toward those goals and how do you know? That's why charities have development directors. Here's an email from Tim in Baltimore. Uh, with a couple of questions for you, Dan Pallotta. He said, Is, isn't Mr. Pallotta just suggesting that nonprofits become as immoral as organizations in the for-profit sector? Should we be aspiring to their outsized salaries, even without intent to match them? I should also note that I'm not exactly a big fan of nonprofits. While I do give a significant portion of my disposable income to charity, I also consider such organizations anti-democratic. The email stops there. I would assume he means that uh, it's not uh, organizations are, are run by boards. Uh, maybe he doesn't find them a, a democratic process, or he doesn't uh, find them to be transparent. But it I don't. Like I, a, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. I don't think you're advocating. It sounds like a really positive guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think you're advocating uh, immorality here. Yeah, no, I don't believe I said anything no. uh, close to that. And, you know, it's funny. People will leap to this argument. Well, I don't want people making the same money as the, you know, the wolf of Wall Street. Well, look at 
the the gap between the amount of money that the head of the American Cancer Association makes and the amount of money the head of Aetna makes is so wide um, that, you know, we, we would have to multiply the head of the American Cancer Society by a, a factor of 50 or 60 to begin to even approach these things. So let's start worrying about that when we get close to it. You know, the... The head of the American Cancer Society last year, I think, made made about seven hundred thousand dollars. And in isolation, we might gasp at that figure. Oh my God, seven hundred thousand dollars! Can you believe that? Until you understand that each of the twenty highest paid college football coaches at nonprofit, tax exempt, government supported universities last year each made two point six million dollars. Now, I don't begrudge college football coaches making that much money. But it is a dysfunctional system that gasps at the head of the American Cancer Society making seven hundred grand, and doesn't blink an eye when a college football coach makes two point six million dollars. And I don't notice a lot of immorality in college football. You know, hmm. let me a- ask you about uh, the, the nonprofits themselves. When you uh, you or anyone presents the idea about investing more to make more, to really grow, to actually make a you know, make enough money so that they can do the things they, they feel they need to do to actually make some change, which may, which may uh, to bring about some change, which may take some time. Uh, that's uh, Time is another factor here. But uh, are they afraid? Are, are nonprofits, the boards of 501c3s, they sit around and they, they debate these questions and then decide not to do anything to maintain status quo because they're afraid to be seen making more money? Well, yeah, or sometimes the executive themselves, you know, they're they're afraid that they'll end up in the media because their organization is paying their CEO three times what any like-size organization is making. They're afraid to spend any serious money on marketing because, you know, that's going to have to be measured in the short term and it's going to show high fundraising costs in the first 12 months. I mean, imagine if we did that to Boeing. Boeing's going to amortize <laughs> the expense of the Dreamliner over the course of 25 years. But, you know, a charity has to amortize the cost of, a, of an ad on NPR or a full-page ad in the newspaper over the course of 12 months. Um, so, yeah, you know, and board members, uh, you know, they serve for a variety of complicated reasons, and they don't want uh, some kind of scandal erupting on their watch uh, while they serve on the board. The the financial incentives aren't there, you know. Uh, So I think that's exactly what you describe is exactly what goes on. Uh, They're afraid of the publicity, too, which, of course, plays into your own uh, uh, story, uh, attention uh, coming to uh, how things are done in a nonprofit uh, when they upscale. Uh, and people react uh, very negatively. Yeah, you know, uh, and and we became very successful very quickly. We netted three hundred and five million dollars after all expenses in nine years. We were the subject of a Harvard Business School case study. I was young at the time. I was in my you know my mid thirties, so it was a lightning rod situation. My name was on the company. You know, we called the company Palata Teamworks and. So it was it was ripe for that kind of controversy, and yeah, it ultimately led to our demise. You know, in two thousand two, our breast cancer uh, sponsor uh, Avon decided to go do the events on their own because they wanted to distance themselves from us. And uh, we netted for them in two thousand two uh, seventy million dollars in unrestricted money for breast cancer research. The next year when they went to try the events on their own, their overhead went up and the net went down to $10 million. So a $60 million loss in one year chasing lower overhead, and they didn't even achieve that. Here's so a, that's I said it, yeah. Ted, you know. This is what happens when we confuse frugality with morality. Mm-hmm. And also in your TED Talk, you speak about, uh, I was very interested in this, the recruitment of talent that could really make a difference in terms of way nonprofits function, not only how they raise money, but how they market themselves, how they raise awareness for their causes, the whole thing. Uh, And I wonder, what are your thoughts about this, the coming generation, you know, the ones coming after the baby boom? Um, Because I, you know, I see uh, a lot of earnestness out there, Uh, young people as always willing to make a difference, wanting to make a difference and willing to sacrifice to do that. Some of them making very low wages after going to graduate school and social work or whatever <laughs> whatever it is because they know they're not going to make very much. 
But there's a lot of competition for that that talent, and I, I just wonder what your thoughts are about young people who may, you know, have a desire to be in a, in a position to make a difference and also have a make a comfortable living. You know, there's one. Yeah, it's a big issue. There's I, I I'll speak at a lot of colleges and I'll ask students to raise their hand. How many of you are going to go to work in the nonprofit sector? And no hands go up. You know, they look at me like, well, why on earth would I do that? Um, yeah, I'm here trying to get a college education so that I can go out and do well economically. I'll serve charity in a different way. I I hear from so many young people um, frustrated at the choice they have between either making money or making a difference. There's one charity in particular um, that does great work, full of young people, really great passion and energy. And those those twenty somethings will come up to me and say, "Oh, I love it here. I really love it here. This is what I'm going to do till I go back to grad school." You know, they're gonna, they can afford to do that when they're 24 or when they're 20. Five. So it's a really horrible choice that we give to people. And some people have said to me, well, look, your argument, I find your argument insulting. Hmm. You're saying that the, that the nonprofit sector does not have the best and the brightest already, that it's going to take money to bring in the best and the brightest. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying the sector doesn't have some of the best and the brightest, but I don't think the sector has all of the best and the brightest. And I don't think it has anywhere near the number of best and brightest that we would actually need to solve these problems. And do we really want to unilaterally say that we don't want some of those best and brightest in the sector because they also happen to care about money? You know, some people don't care about money. I say, well, great, then don't ask, don't ask for a raise, you know, but there are other people who do. And, and, and there's a level of arrogance in denying them access to the sector because you're uncomfortable with the amount of money that they want to make. And some people will say to me, well, people who want to make a lot of money don't belong in the nonprofit sector. Oh, really? But they belong on your boards, right? And that, so you can raise all kinds of money from them. And they, be, they belong in the sector creating foundations that you can get massive grants from, you know, that's uh, that's just woefully inaccurate to say that somehow a desire for money negates any goodness in your heart. Uh, Dan Pallotta, our guest on uh, Midday, his uh, most recent book on this subject that we're discussing is uh, Charity Case, How the Nonprofit World Can Stand Up for Itself and Really Change the World. Uh, he, he is the founder of Advertising for Humanity as well as the Charities Defense Council. Uh, and you may have heard his TED Talk here on WYPR on uh, on the TED Radio Hour in December, if not earlier, uh, last year. Uh, let's take a couple of calls while, while we can before our next break. Uh, this is Garth in Roland Park. Thank you for calling Midday. You're on with Dan Pallotta. Yeah. Hi, Dan and Dan. Um, I, I joined the, 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 the show about quarter after, so I'm not sure if you covered this to some degree. But um, I, I think, obviously, a, a big factor is if there's ways to measure, you know, effectiveness and all that. And um, if there is such a source, or I, was, uh, I mentioned to the screener about uh, consumer reports. I mean, that's how I sort of try to judge what's worthy of my investment in a product or services or whatever it is. You know, I go to consumer reports. Is there something in the charity world like that? And if not, you know, maybe... There, you know, one could make some effort where, you you know, obviously Consumer Reports does, you know, they judge different categories and, right. you know, that sort of thing. And, and, and <clears> then <throat> obviously recommendations based on value, which can be a function of how efficient the spending, you know, but whatever. But you could you could have these different categories that you're looking at and decide what. And if, <clears> if something like Consumer Reports, maybe that'd be helpful. I don't know if there's something like that. I don't know if now. there's a, a single source like that. Uh, Dan, you touched on this a little bit earlier. What, what, what do you, you want to go back to that? What do you recommend for folks uh, who are considering charitable giving? Yeah, as you can imagine, you know, this is difficult stuff. You, you buy an iPhone and you have information immediately about the quality of that product right there in your hands. Charity, you know, trying to trying to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease, that's a much more difficult thing. And you're not in the lab looking at the research. So I think, I think there are three criti- critical questions. What are your goals? What progress are you making toward those goals? And how do you know? I think those are the three critical questions. Unfortunately, we don't have a systematic way or a systematic agency for asking those questions and giving those answers to the American public, which is why I tell people, you know, do investigation on your own. But, you know, we have these seven-figure, you know, million-dollar organizations like Charity Navigator with, with 12 or 13 staff to try and service 
you know, 1.5 million nonprofits taking in, you know, $300 billion in donations. We don't need a $1 million organization. We need something like a $200 million infrastructure in the United States for giving the public the kind of information your listener is asking for in a really super friendly um, way that's updated and that's available for every charity. So that that's... Uh, you know, for the for the cost of a couple jet fighters, we could build an infrastructure like that, and we hmm. desperately need it. Most and most of your advice is for the nonprofit sector themselves, the people who run nonprofits, the boards of nonprofits. I know your your message is for everybody, but it's specifically uh, aimed at the nonprofits to get them thinking about uh, new ways uh, of doing doing things here. But you you also say in the TED talk that people want to be asked, people want to be engaged, meaning those who give. And, and the, the, uh, the programs that you came up with to raise money engage thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. People want their lives to matter. And all those wonderful listeners that you have out there, they give their hard-earned money to charity. And they give it ultimately not because they want low overhead. They give it because they want to help people, because they want these problems to be solved. So it's a great injustice to me. Um, that they've had the wool pulled over their eyes with these inept ways of measuring things that aren't really telling them whether a difference is being made or not. Dan, we'll take a short break here, come back, t- take some more phone calls for you, and I have some emails to read. 410-662-8780 is our phone number here. You're listening to Midday. Our guest this hour, Dan uh, Pilata, author of Charity Case, How the Nonprofit World Can Stand Up for Itself and Really Change the World. interesting comment on Facebook posted by Julie. She says, I volunteer with a nonprofit in Annapolis. It's been around for 20 years helping people out of homelessness uh, and get into substance abuse treatment. Our director, who is out on the street doing 90% of the work and is available to help the community any time of day of night, is a percussionist in several bands, has a small catering business and a small security business to earn a small income. In the last year, when we did better financially, we finally were able to commit to paying his mortgage so that he wouldn't be foreclosed upon, something that nearly happened. Uh, adding to his salary uh, makes our overhead appear worse because our costs to operate are very low. Uh, what we really need is to pay him so he doesn't have to scramble for money. But this money is hard to defend when writing grants or doing fundraising. What Dan Pilata says is gospel to me. We have to take care of the helpers. No one can do this specific job that our director does. But he has this calling. Why shouldn't we make sure he has the resources to do his job without struggling to make a living? There is a painful discrepancy between the profit and nonprofit worlds. That's on the Dan Rodericks Facebook page. If you care to uh, post your comments there as well, I'll go to Dan Pilata for his reaction to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that this guy has a, a great clarity of mind to focus on how to end homelessness, but worrying about paying his ma- mortgage and, 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 and doing three other jobs. And see, that's the real question. It's not how much are you paying this person. It's what is this person, uh, what value is this person providing? What value do you want this person to provide? Because, you know, the goodness of a person's heart will only take so much career jeopardizing risk and the goodness of a person's heart will only do so many multiples of the work they're already doing for the same amount of money so if we want to produce more value then money's going to have to be a part of the picture the same way that it is in the rest of the economy you wouldn't go into a bakery and say give me you know two cakes for the same price as i could get for one but that's exactly what we expect in the nonprofit sector work twice as hard, three times as hard, four times as hard, but I'm only going to pay you for one cake. Let's take another call for Dan Pilata, our guest in this hour of midday. Mary in Baltimore, thank you for holding. Go right ahead. Hey, um, thank you so much. Um, as a former social worker myself of 12 years, and I specifically only worked in the nonprofit sector, I worked for several different organizations, some that my desk was a two-by, like made out of saw horses and plywood, <laughs> to another nonprofit where we were buying chairs and office equipment every at the end of the fiscal year just to spend money to get more money in the grant cycle. Um, I've, I've seen the discrepancy between nonprofits, and there's some great nonprofits out there working shoestring budgets, and, and it is ridiculous. 
they sh- the folks should be really, you know, be able to have a living wage, be able to ha- afford their mortgage. But other nonprofits, they could use their money better. And I think it really does come down to that accountability or that last caller, like Garth said, how do you measure it? I know of a, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head right now, but there's a nonprofit out in California, and the way that they did accountability of their own work was having evaluations from their non the, the clients of the nonprofit, the workers, the board members, and the the fund people that um, gave money, the donors. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that you see on a grander scale happening like that, where you're actually asking for that feedback, that account for accountability reasons from the people that benefit from the nonprofit, but not but also the workers in the nonprofit. Well, um, there's an organization called Great Nonprofits that is uh, kind of like a, a, a Yelp-like rating service for nonprofits that's beginning uh, to add uh, the uh, ability for clients to rate the, pro- the, the nonprofit as well. Um, but as you can imagine, that might be difficult for a charity that doesn't really have clients. You know, say the research lab that's working on the cure for breast cancer or um, an organization that's doing overseas development work or human rights work where it's not easy, um, you know, to get those clients, so to speak, to rate the charity. So that has some usefulness, but it's not a universal answer. Let's take another call, Dan. Here's uh, Matthew in Owings Mills. You're on Midday. Hi. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to uh, start with my background, which is uh, when I was in college, I was actually on a student government board which conducted audits of the university. Um, and secondly, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, but I actually incorporated a not-for-profit, took it through the 501c3 process. Um, so, so I have a background in charity, and I have... Uh, Two points, and the first one is, and this was my experience at the school, was at the time the school was very big on trying to improve its reputation, and they are devoting a lot of resources to it. And one of the problems with that, and, I, and like I said, this is an organizational problem, I'm not saying it's something that's universal, is that it tended to dominate what they were doing. That is, as they devoted more resources to it, more of the institutional intellectual capital was directed toward how do we improve the reputation of the institution rather than its core mission. And the second one is, and I heard this on Marketplace with Dan Ariely, were some studies that they did in India about uh, remuneration, and uh, specifically what they discovered is is that um, when you look at the correlation between how much you pay someone and the performance they deliver, if you have a, a, a medium level of compensation would deliver a higher performance than a low compensation, but a very high level of compensation will deliver a lower performance than even the low level of compensation. All right, let's let's talk about those two things uh, and get Dan's reaction. First, uh, focusing so much on the uh, new mission, uh, raising awareness of the profile of an institution and getting away from the core mission. And then, you know, the, if you want to talk about remuneration in terms of return that you get for increasing someone's salary. So go ahead, Dan. Um, Yeah, I think uh, taking the second issue first, you you know, I just find the argument um, rather ridiculous that more money doesn't give you access to a greater talent pool or that it doesn't incentivize the production of more value. If, if money doesn't matter, then why not pay the executive director the same amount of money that you pay the janitorial staff? Uh, why not pay college football coaches that amount of money? You know, more money generally allows you to hire from um, a less fungible, less transferable talent pool. And, you know, look at something like the real estate industry. Imagine if you told real estate agents, um, you only get paid for the first three houses you sell. Then you have to sell all the other houses for the same amount of money that you uh, were paid for the first three houses. You know, the idea that people don't have aspirations, that if they work harder, I could send my kid to a better school, I could take better care of my parents in their older age, um, 
I could move into a nicer neighborhood. The the idea that that has no effect on people, I, I just think is was out basis and flies in the face of the whole of economic history. Um, the other issue of you know focusing too much on reputation versus mission, I think that's the problem we've had. I think we've got an awful lot of focus at nonprofits on proving to the general public that overhead is low and not nearly enough focus on uh, showing the general public what progress is being made toward the solving of problems. You know, I, maybe it's because of my job as a, a columnist with the Baltimore Sun. I'm in touch with, uh, and this radio show, in touch with a lot of organizations that, that are nonprofit, that are in social services in Baltimore City in particular. And they seem to be on shoestrings all the time. They seem to be really grasping around. As, during the recession in particular, they cut staff, a lot of them. They had to. Um, I mean, they seem to be really desperate. So I don't, you know, this idea of cushy offices and, and exorbitant salaries uh, and uh, it just seems kind of foreign to me based on my own experience here in Baltimore. Yeah, and that's the other part of it. For some reason, you know, maybe it's our own economic jealousy or envy or something. People love to focus on this compensation issue, but it's it goes way beyond compensation. So let's say that you can a- a- attract a really bright, you know, Ivy League MBA to a nonprofit, uh, but then you tell the person uh, for a low salary. But then you tell the person, oh, you can't pay anyone else very much money, so you c- you can't recruit all your pals that you graduated with. You don't have an advertising budget to try and grow the organization. We really don't want you taking any risks on any new ideas. Um, We don't have a stock market, so you don't have any capital for trying out those ideas. And everything you do has to turn out successful within the first 12 months. (laughs) Well, you know, it's it's, it's just a non-starter. So it's a holistic system of deprivation and dysfunction. It's not just the compensation issue. You know, when you... You go over to Apple and you look at Johnny Ivey's lab and all the toys that he gets to play with. And then you go to a nonprofit and you tell people you don't have any toys to play with. Not only are we going to pay you very little money, but you don't have any resources with which to try and fulfill your real potential. What kind of an offer is that? And also, when you mentioned the word time there, because you addressed time in your in your TED Talk, which, by the way, is posted on my Facebook page, folks. You can hear the whole thing. It runs about 18 minutes. Uh Amazon has been given plenty of time by stockholders. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to They've been, they, profit, you know, six right? six years before they turned a profit. Now, that last year, they posted three consecutive quarters of losses. Twenty years into their business, and two days after the last loss they posted, their stock went to an all time high. You know, Twitter is worth like I think forty billion dollars now. Twitter lost a hundred and eighty million dollars last quarter. Can you imagine us having that kind of patience for a nonprofit endeavor? Uh, no, and when you, when it when it comes to nonprofit, at least some of the causes that I'm familiar with, these are things that do take a long time. You know, ending homelessness as we know it in Baltimore City, uh, for instance, uh, getting more uh, people employed in Baltimore City, getting them getting them trained for jobs, getting them off drugs. These things take uh, lots of time and lots of effort. You you can't turn that around in a year famous quote from Steve Jobs where he said the trouble with philanthropy is that you can't measure whether you're succeeding or failing. So, you know, everybody applauds Steve Jobs, as do I. He's a hero of mine. But but he picked something relatively easy to do, you know, make a computer that doesn't suck. Getting, <laughs> getting the, you know, solving a problem like, you know, structural poverty and homelessness is far, far, far more difficult. The last thing we should be doing is giving the organizations trying to solve it less permission than we give Apple to build an iPhone. Do you think it has some traction, Dan? I mean, the TED Talk got all these views, and you've, you've gotten a lot of positive feedback on it. Yeah, the world is changing. The conversation is changing. Um, not only, I told you about the three watchdogs that issued that press release. That's a huge change. Yeah, that change. was big. You know, years ago, there, were no, there was no Stanford Social Enterprise, a Stanford Social Innovation Review. There were no classes on this at Harvard. There are now. Um, right. So I think things are changing. we got to go. I, I appreciate getting, getting to talk with you today, Dan. Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Dan. Yep, Dan Pilata. Uh, Dan Pilata, uh, who's uh, TED Radio Hour and TED Talk can be heard uh, if you want to listen to it online. It's on the Dan Roderick's uh, Facebook page. Very, very provocative uh, uh, conversation and uh, subject there. And very, I found it very persuasive. I'd like to hear from you. If you have a chance to hear the whole thing and want to send us an email about it, I'd love to get some feedback on it. Midday at WYPR.org. We'll take a break now. This is the end of our first hour. We've got the news coming up. And then the second hour of Midday, Midday on Science coming your way shortly.